Hello and welcome to The Close Read, a production of the Claremont Institute. I'm your host, assistant editor Spencer Claven, and I will be diving every episode into an essay or review from the latest issue of the Claremont Review of Books, the gold standard in conservative thought and political philosophy. Each time we publish an issue, I will sit down with a few authors and dig deeper into the themes and ideas that motivated their writing. Thanks for joining us. Let's get started. As we always do each time we come out with a new issue, we are fortunate to sit down with the man, the legend himself, Professor Charles Kessler. He is our editor. He's a professor at Claremont McKenna College. He's his government and American civics and things of that nature. And he has a book. You're making up. that up. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I was I was just going to call you a professor of government, but I didn't. It, it seemed, seemed as if that wasn't quite extensive enough. I don't know. Do you describe uh, yourself that way? I am a distinguished professor of government, yeah. <laughs> according to the school. I, I don't put much uh, credence in that myself. But anyway, that's the title. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you for calling me out. You're right. I did kind of conjure that title out of thin air, but I, I will I will conjure yet more and throw them at you by mentioning that you are the author of a forthcoming book, Crisis of the Two Constitutions. It is Seems as if it will be out at the end of this year. People can pre-order it now on Amazon or wherever they get their books. But we're all looking forward to the emergence of that. So welcome. Yes, thank you. And it will have a uh, appreciate that um, little bit of flacking there uh, for, <laughs> on my behalf. We're shameless uh, Spencer, over here. Yeah. <laughs> it, the, the book will have a cover by the great Elliot Banfield, who does the covers of the Claremont Review of Books and all the art inside. And the design inside as well. So uh, I'm very proud of that. I think uh, it looks uh, very good and quite distinctive. Yes, I was just looking at the cover just now. It is classic Elliot, I think uh, you, you might say, has one of that wonderful uh, sketched and yet detailed look that we rely upon for the, the Claremont Review of Books as well. And so, so here we are now with this with this new issue. Um, and I'm just turning over the cover to make sure I'm getting this right. Yes, it, it's number three in our in our uh, 20th volume, our 20th anniversary volume, and our summer 2020 issue. We usually kick things off, Charles, by chatting about major themes in the sure. latest issue. Sure. And in this case, uh, it's hard to kind of avoid the major themes. The, the title, the cover of our issue is the American crisis. This is for you and me. This is the second remote podcast that we've done because last time we chatted, we were already in coronavirus lockdowns. Things have only intensified since then. The country has seen a, a tremendous kind of upheaval, riots, the tearing down of statues to which our cover art also by Mr. Banfield refers. And as I was kind of reviewing the table of contents here, I was particularly struck in the essays section by the fact that we've really devoted a tremendous amount of attention to, to these upheavals as we would have to, as it would be impossible not to do in a journal of political thought and statesmanship. I was wondering, Charles, if anything strikes you as distinctive here about the Claremont response to this moment, perhaps as compared with other conservative responses or just with the media response more generally. Well, I think we've been um, and continue to be more uh, critical, both of the coronavirus um, uh, lockdowns um, and the uh, their attendant politics, you might say, and more critical of um, the riots, uh, the civil disorders um, and the general chaos <laughs> hmm. um, in our in our um, cities uh, than at least some other conservative um, outlets, um, some other conservative journals. So the cover itself is a uh, is a focuses on the statues or the statue side, as uh, <laughs> I sometimes call it, the, the yep. death, the murder of statues. Um, <laughs> That's CID, the, not uh, the side of the statues, but the statue side, uh, the killing the statue of statue side. Right. Exactly. Okay, yeah. <laughs> the, the, the rampant commission of statue side all across <laughs> um, the country, which is, uh, uh, you know, uh, not I mean, it, pulling down statues, as everyone knows, in a certain sense, is not 
new. It's not unusual. Um, I mean, when the uh, Soviet Union collapsed, the first thing people did was pull down statues of Lenin uh, and even Stalin. When Saddam Hussein was overthrown, the first thing people did was tear down the giant, <laughs> super <laughs> life-size um, statue, uh, and, and probably more than one, of Saddam Hussein. And uh, even in the American Revolution, one of the first things that um, patriots did in New York City in Manhattan after hearing the Declaration of Independence read for the first time, General Washington was on horseback and was presiding over the reading of the Declaration of Independence. He left, um, the dignitaries left, and the people went down Broadway to a giant recently erected statue more than life size of King George the Third, gilded in gold, and pulled it down. Mm -hmm. um, they too committed statue side of, of a sort. They shot it through the head <laughs> with a rifle or <laughs> some sort of <laughs> a gun, and uh, and then the I suppose the ultimate insult they melted it down, separating the gold from the uh, lead and turned the lead into some forty thousand bullets, <laughs> <laughs> which were then returned. To sender <laughs> through, <laughs> through were. the unfortunate bodies uh, of some uh, redcoat uh, soldiers uh, <laughs> in the next couple of battles. So there's nothing. There's nothing sort of um, all that unusual about pulling down statues, but it does indicate a certain kind of revolutionary act. Mm -hmm. And I think it's. Um, I think a lot of people are not facing up to the implications of. The, the the attack on statues that's going on mm. um, all all up and down the country. I mean, it, it is it's the it's the prelude or the opening act of revolution, really, to do to to do something like that. Um, but it does raise the question: whose statues are you going to put up mm. after you've torn down all the statues that are associated with the existing regime? And that's really that's the as you know the topic of my editor's note is really the other half of this. Indeed. So, uh, you know, what statues are going to go up? What statues is Black Lives Matter or anyone, the protesters? What, what, who are their heroes? Right. What, what exactly are we being asked to pledge allegiance to under a new regime? Indeed. I think one thing that Claremont has been attempting to make abundantly clear in its response to this moment is what you indicate that this is in fact, a regime level crisis. And you, you cite many sort of important examples of, of t statue tearing down and other, and other similar behaviors to our present yeah. kind of rioting class, a rioting crowd. Uh, of course, it's ancient as well. I mean, the Demnatio Memoriae, the kind of Roman practice, especially in the empire of tearing down the old Domitian, you know, in, to make way for Trajan and so forth. Um, and yeah, I, I wonder whether some of our compatriots, even our well-meaning compatriots, understand that this is something you do when you want to enforce a fully new takeover, a revolutionary takeover of the, of the existing regime. Uh, I want to get to your editor's note in a bit because, as you say, right, it asks this very pertinent question, what's going up in the place of the American regime if it is indeed to be torn down? I think one thing that kind of just before we leave the essays in this issue, one thing that struck me also related to what you're saying is the historical sweep of them. So we've got Angelo Cotavilla who looks at kind of the millenarian impulse to tear down statues in the name of an apocalyptic vision or to, to tear down regimes in the name of an apocalyptic vision all the way up through Christopher Caldwell who takes us through kind of the legacy of civil rights law and its its role in this as a uniquely American history. Mm -hmm. um, sandwiched in between there, we've got Samuelson, Richard Samuelson on the New York Times and kind of some, some deeper American history or, or rather older American history. Uh, I, I want to ask you the perennially annoying question that conservatives often, I think, get asked. Uh, I sometimes get asked this in, in relation to the CRB, which is, uh, what what do we now do with all of this uh, magnificent erudition? I think there is some there is some helpful so there are some helpful suggestions in the issue, but I'd like to hear your response here. You know, uh, given our now deepened understanding of what what we're up against, what should we be encouraging perhaps 
people uh, in our circles to be doing in response to what's going on? Well, uh, that's a big question, really. Mm -hmm. um, and I'd be interested to hear what your uh, conclusions are. But I, I, certainly one thing you have to do is resist the resistance. Mm -hmm. um, right. I think, uh, first of all, intellectually and, um, and politically. And that means, um, uh, you know, and also electorally. Um, but as a 501c3, I'm mm -hmm. not endorsing any particular <laughs> candidate no, uh, no, no, I, on this podcast. Right. However, um, I think um, um, other people in the Claremont circle uh, have uh, drawn uh, the, the political conclusions very clearly from it. Tom Klingenstein, for example, has right. written several excellent pieces that the American mind um, has run our sister um, uh, web website and web publication over which uh, Spencer presides or over part of which Spencer presides, of course, mm -hmm. and very well. But I think you uh, w one has to realize what a pickle we're in. Mm. And, you know, when people at the New York Times are being fired and, uh, you know, what sports figures are being fired uh, you know, ex sports heroes are being fired because um, or or demeaned because they are politically incorrect, because they are not racist, but systemically racist. They're not actual racists. Mm, right. uh, they just participate willingly or not in a system of racism, which gives us this strange diagnosis of racism without racists. Right. I mean, that's really the what the left is preaching mm -hmm. right now. Everyone is guilty, but no one right. is guilty of anything in particular um, or anything serious in particular. Um, you know, that way is madness. Mm -hmm. And it, it, one has to simply um, find the courage to resist it. Intellectually, we're diagnosing it, but that does not supply the courage, the backbone that people have to find um, in themselves to do something about it, whether it's just arguing or with it or voting in a certain way, or maybe in some cases, even counter demonstrations of one kind or another. Right. I, it's something that I often stress is that in these situations, there is unfortunately no substitute for the kind of courage that you're identifying here. Right? I, I feel very lucky that uh, my employer, if anything, is going to get on my case for not speaking out enough, right? <laughs> uh, and not even that. But you know, the, the um, many, many people are not in that fortunate position right. where they feel that they are putting themselves at very, very serious risk of livelihood and, in some cases, even life and limb by by speaking up. And so, it is, I think, incumbent upon those of us who do have platforms from which to speak out to really support and encourage others who do not. Uh, I also think the essays by Tom Klingenstein, to which you allude, one of them just went up at the American Mind about sort of how to, as it were, respond to this moment. The, um, one of the things he stresses that I think is really right is without advocating that people vote in any one particular way, we can stress that they should demand of their elected officials both in and presently out of and seeking office, a, a, a full understanding of the gravity of this moment. I think it, it, a lot of elected officials or people running for office just don't get where we're at. And I think that's one thing that people can can benefit from reading this particular issue to kind of gain that understanding and, and insist yeah, upon the, I mean, this obviously means the, the stakes of this election are very high right. and, you know, maybe so, somewhat different from what people are thinking. Right. Uh, and, and they need to acquaint themselves, I think, uh, with that if they can. One of our authors in, uh, in this issue is Alexander Solzhenitsyn. Right. Um, who, now, <laughs> we, re we actually resurrected him specifically for this. It, from issue. a more conventional point of view, he can't really write for us uh, voluntarily anymore. Uh, but um, we have an excerpt from his um, um, uh, memoirs, which are just now being published and translated um, into English, his memoirs after his exile uh, or during his exile from the Soviet Union when he came over to the West. But um, apropos of, of our conversation on courage, at, you know, we, we're um, sort of coming up on an anniversary of uh, his 1978 commencement speech at Harvard University, um, 
and which made an enormous impact on America and led to a month or several months of uh, heated conversations and editorial pages in the newspaper and on television and everywhere, people talking about the speech. But one of the things, it happened to be my commencement speech. So I was there. Oh, I, you can't, I, I, I did not know that. The only that. 20th century <laughs> commencement speech worth remembering, oh probably. Oh, gosh. Wow. I was All lucky right. enough to be there at that time. Okay. But uh, one of the prime, uh, the leading elements of his of his uh, speech, um, which was called uh, A World Split Apart, hmm. uh, was that the West had lost its civic courage. Hmm. Um, and uh, right. this line, I think, echoes uh, down the decades since. Uh, this is a kind of test of our civic courage. Now, I mean, personal courage, of course, is one thing and is probably a part of civic courage. But civic courage means, in a way, you're, you're, we're in danger of losing the courage of our convictions mm. um, because we're in danger of losing our convictions, first mm. of all. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And we need both. We need we need to know what our convictions are and uh, and why they are um, true and persuasive. But we also then need to find the courage to actually stand up for them. And um, it it you know the fall of the Soviet Union was um, um, a, a very happy event for us and for Solzhenitsyn for everyone. Um, but it didn't quite end the crisis that he was talking about. Uh, because even though we came out as victors, mm. we didn't actually defeat the Soviet Union. They collapsed. Right. And, and so uh, Harry Jaffa famously compared this situation to two prize fighters entering the ring for the big match to determine like world <laughs> you know, champion. <laughs> right. And one of them has a heart attack and drops dead. <laughs> And mm-hmm. yeah, the other one is the victor, but he didn't actually knock him out. You know, he didn't earn the victory mm. in quite the same way he might have been expected to. And that's what happened to the, to the East. And the West found itself in the strange position of being the victor mm. uh, without actually having won, you know, having fought a war uh, or the equivalent of war in order to win. So in, in that sense, uh, the West still wonders why we won. <laughs> what, you know, what, what, how, how is it that we won exactly? Mm. And so that sort of emptiness and that sort of, um, um, uh, I think, um, blank center to modern liberalism is still the problem. Mm. And, and so the social, socialism is still very relevant, uh, even though he has been dead for a while and that Harvard speech was a long time ago. Mm. I'm, I'm probably not the only person to be constantly quoting Yeats's second coming at this time, mm-hmm. but I do always recur to that line, which I'm going to quote from memory. So prop, mm-hmm. for, our listeners should forgive me if I get it wrong, but it's something to the effect of the, the best lack all conviction while the worst are full of passionate intensity, which right, right. Uh, yeah. it's a useful distinction that you invoke between courage, personal courage and civic courage. And it brings us nicely to your editor's note facing Mount Rushmore, which opens up the issue. I've told you uh, personally that this is uh, one of the most moving, I think, of yours, um, which is saying something. And it's about, in some sense, it's centered around an instance of civic courage, centered around Trump's speech on July 4th, President Trump's speech at Mount Rushmore. And I will read just briefly one paragraph from what you say and then uh, ask you a question about it. Trump vowed to protect Mount Rushmore against defacement, a new element in our patriotic oratory. It would not be easy to pull down this great granite edifice, unlike the statues of Washington and Jefferson toppled in Seattle and around the country lately. But it's all too easy to defile the ideas that gave rise to this vast and soaring monument and to this vast and beneficent country. The speech's most striking passages responded indignantly to that threat. One of the things that I found most remarkable about the opening to this piece in which you talk about your book on Obama from eight years ago uh, and, and reflecting on kind of who would be on a liberal Mount Rushmore, who were some kind of the great heroes of, of the American left, um, is that you, you kind of lead us from there to realizing that there is nobody really safe enough from character assassination in the new American left to merit, you know, permanent sort of 
imposition on a mountain or, or anything like that. There are no people they can erect statues to. It's so recent that there was at least a left with whom we may have disagreed and who may have had internal disagreements, but who could have been imagined celebrating heroes of some kind, American heroes. Uh, where's that? Where has that old left gone? Uh, and why? How so quickly? I mean, in your view, what brought about the, just the complete kind of collapse of the the principled left? Hmm. Well, I, I think the one way to answer your question is the that that old left is now um, the <laughs> presidential no nominee of the Democratic Party. <laughs> right. I mean, of the of the various septuagenarians who were competing uh, for that honor, mm. um, they picked Joe Biden, the the frailest of them all. Yeah. Uh, and he, um, uh, I mean, he came from a a pre sixties. Uh, American left. And the, the short answer, even uh, maybe not not as short as that answer, but <laughs> the other answer to your question is um, it was the anti-American turn that the left took basically in the 1960s and early 70s, I think, that really has doomed them to go down this path. And they've never really completely turned back from it. It's, it, it's certainly the case that um, they've tried. Hmm. Jimmy Carter was an attempt to sort of recover some affection for the American flag and for serving in the military and for the patriot, ordinary patriots and patriotism. Right. And Bill Clinton, in his own way, was an attempt to moderate the party, uh, too. And even Obama, who had a, had a more uh, Obama was a guy who had a more radical core. Mm -hmm. But uh, on the periphery, he was very patriotic. I mean, he quoted the Declaration of Independence probably more than any president has in a long time in his speeches. Hmm. Um, at least I think both of his inaugurals quote the Declaration of Independence. Certainly one of them does. Um, but uh, when you look at the fine print of Obama's treatment, say, you find out that it's, a uh, you know, the goalposts keep moving. Hmm. And the America that he's talking about is never really the America of the past or the present, but but the imaginary country of the future transformed by his leadership and by, you know, subsequent uh, progressive president's leadership. And so they really they there is a real problem on the left that they they don't know how to love an imperfect America. Hmm. Um and to the extent they love in America at all, it's the, the it's like you know communist society at the end of the future. <laughs> no one yeah. has ever seen yeah. this land of perfection, which lies always over the next hill. Mm. Um, and and so it one doesn't really know how far to trust that kind of patriotism, mm. since it's uh, it's alienating you uh, almost necessarily from all existing Americans. Um, and from most of the people in America's past. Mm. It's the, the future America whose horizon fades forever and forever when we move, to paraphrase Tennyson. You know, it's just kind of just... Yes, that's right. And it's, uh, you know, and that America, it's not even clear that it, it's not bigger than that, you know, a transnational right. America, which becomes the world uh, or, you know, some future version of the world, of humanity. Hmm. rather than your fellow citizens. So does uh, Sleepy Joe have any chutzpah left in him, do you think, to put his foot down and resist this uh, transformation, or is it just a hopeless cause for them? Um, we'll find out. So far, I, I, I've been um, uh, haphazardly watching the Democratic National Convention. Right. And uh, it's... It's been very uh, well produced and very, you know, patriotic, mm. or at least faux patriotic. Mm -hmm. um, lots of flags, lot, you know, singing the national anthem, and right. a lot of uh, um, military or, or ex-military people speaking. Um, it looks like the old Democratic Party. And, uh, you know, uh, AOC gets only the sh briefest shot at the microphone. 
uh, lest the appearance be punctured. Hmm. Um, and the new Democratic Party emerged from behind, <laughs> behind the <laughs> carefully structured scenery. Right. Um, so I don't know. I mean, uh, this is this is sort of like Joe Biden's party. I mean, you know, he, Joe Biden is not even a baby boomer. He's hmm. too old to be a baby boomer. He's right. a pre baby boomer. He really is the last gasp uh, in certain respects, at least of the old America hmm. um, before the baby boom. Now. You know, that's uh, maybe that should be comforting. And maybe he what we see is real, at least uh, concerning him. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the future of the party is not Joe Biden. Um, mm. The future of the party is, um, I would say, much more in the streets, you know, mobs pulling down statues, not just of Confederate generals, but of uh, Washington and Lincoln and indeed of black soldiers who fought in the civil war mm. abolitionist leaders you know saints <laughs> of the catholic church <laughs> right uh, you know, it's really it's really a revolt against the whole old regime yeah and jesus um, and at that's one point, just I mean, right, it yeah. has not yet appeared in the democratic national convention really mm. and the question is can they keep this act going for four days right and through uh november uh or will the cloven hoof of the revolution uh -huh. show itself. Huh. That's a fascinating framing, especially given, you know, I, I don't think national conventions are ever particularly devoid of artifice, but there's even more opportunity for artifice under the present conditions when you're doing this remote. I mean, it's almost a kind of our colleague, James Poulos, would call it like a, te a televisual digital morass of just fantasy, you know, this kind of just <laughs> putting this all. Yes, uh, no, and it, yeah. uh, highly artificial because mm -hmm. it's entirely produced. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, most of the people, there are a few people speaking live. Right. Um, but most of the stuff you see in this so-called convention is all video produced by the uh, Democratic National Committee or somebody. Yeah, yeah. That came across in uh, Michelle Obama's speech, I thought, especially. There was very visibly kind of pre- planned and scripted. Um, we are running out of time, as is our want, but um, I want to just close out by reading this one of these last paragraphs, or the conclusion, rather, to your editor's note. You say, to whom will Black Lives Matter, the organization, not the slogan, and the liberal Democrats now marching in its train be erecting statues? Certainly not to Martin Luther King, who insisted on nonviolence and a colorblind constitution, causes no longer in favor, nor to Barack, Barack Obama, whom the BLM true believers dismiss as an Uncle Tom. And then you finish off, they could learn from Trump. It's the statues you put up, not the ones you pull down, that define a great nation. And that is the intro to this issue, which we've been here chatting about. It's the third issue of our 20th volume. You can find it uh, online if you're a subscriber and you will get future issues delivered straight to your door if you become a subscriber. So we hardly recommend that you do so. Charles, thanks again so much for joining us. It is always a pleasure to see you even remotely via Zoom. <laughs> yes, you're very <laughs> welcome. And the pleasure is all mine. Thank you. Thanks for listening to this episode of The Close Read, a Claremont review of books podcast and a production of the Claremont Institute. Our publisher is Ryan Williams. Our producer is Jake Gannon. And I'm your host, Spencer Claven. Thanks to Benjamin Squirit for our music. If you liked this episode and you'd like to hear more in-depth interviews based on the Claremont review of books, please do subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. We're available on all major platforms. And if you'd like to support us, we encourage you to leave a five-star review on iTunes. Thanks again for listening, and we will see you again next time.